If I asked you guys who is the most broken person in the Bible, who would you say? Job. Okay. Do we agree? Someone disagree? There's someone who was broken more than Job was. Rob? So you're thinking very diligently. Hmm. Yeah, maybe Mary comes close, but... Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't think of her. Job got pretty, pretty messed up. Yeah, pretty messed up. Okay. David got pretty messed up, too. <sighs> yeah, he's also a king. <laughs> so, I don't know if... But you're right, it is. He was definitely broken. So if we look at that, right, if we look at it from that standpoint, of, of, with that standpoint, that view, we look at that all the people who were called were either, one, broken already, or God breaks them. Was Job broken initially at first? Yeah. He was wealthy. No, he was, he was good. Oh. Right? I mean, he was so good that God says, he goes to Satan, have you seen Job? Ooh, that's my boy right there. Like he's he's on point. He has faith. He's he's good. And Satan goes, yeah, that's because you give him. Look at his bank account. So he's of course he's he's worshiping you. So God goes, okay, break him. And and, and God says, don't just break him. I mean, really break him. Take his kids. Take his money. Even give him a disease. And he does. Because he's completely broken. We look at Moses, right? Was Moses broken? I'm sorry. Yes, Moses. Was Moses broken to begin with? Did he start broken? No. No. Where was he living? Pharaoh's In the palace. He was doing great. And then something happened within him. And then he becomes a slave. And God breaks him. We look at Paul, right? Uh, we look at fishermen, we look at tax collectors, we look at Pharisees, we look at Paul. The problem with Paul is that Paul wasn't broken, but Paul didn't know that he was broken. See, Paul was, he was doing okay. Paul had a great job. Paul was considered to be one of the highest people, like in his society, he had a great job. He persecuted the Christians because he was so fervent in his faith. But Paul had no idea that he was broken, so God comes along and he breaks him. For what purpose? Like, why does God break people, right? Like, why does God do this to people? Now, I want to start with Job for a little bit, because one of the things that I really want to address is, and, and I'm, it's a question I'm going to ask, okay? Um, we go to Job chapter 2 for me. Now, we know the story of Job, right? We all know it for the most part, okay? So, Job is a good guy. Job is a faithful guy. He actually, Job is so good that he makes sacrifices to God just in case his kids accidentally um, offended God. That's how good Job is. That's how faithful Job is. And Satan comes one day and he says, and God says, have you seen Job? And Satan goes, yeah, I've seen Job. You really take care of him and that's why he worships you. That's why he's so good. So God allows Satan to break him. And he breaks him, Right? And he breaks him to the point that Job is so afflicted, that Job is so hurt, that Job is in so much pain, that he's itching so much, that he sits in ashes, and he grabs the ashes, and he scratches himself with them. That's how bad Job is. And then Job's friends show up. Okay, Job chapter 2. Uh, verse... Let's see, I think it's 13. Yeah, it started at 11. Um, Dave, read it. <clears throat> now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they, they came each from his own place. Eliphaz and... Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shu, Shuhite, mm -hmm. and so far the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. Okay, so why did they come to Job? First of all, what did they hear? They heard of everything that had happened to him, right? All the evil that had come upon Job. They heard about it, okay? So, and why, why else did they come? You just read it. To offer him what? Sympathy. Sympathy. Comfort. 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 Are these good things? Mm -hmm. Are these good friends? Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. Okay, 
Are, are do they love Joe? Yeah. How much do they love Joe? Okay, how much can you tell they love Joe? A lot, a lot. Why? Did yeah. they sympathize? Mm -hmm. Did they did they see the pain in Joe? Were they moved by Joe's pain? They felt his pain. They felt his pain. They they tore their clothes. It, it was a sign of grieving. It was a sign of, of mourning is when you tear your clothes up and it rips. It's like you don't care about what you look like and you're mourning in that moment. Keep going. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. Okay, before. and that's the part that I love, okay? I love this part. Now, I love, now, it, it, you're going to hear most messages because it's true. If you keep reading, okay, after seven days, so they sat for Job seven days, okay? And, and it says that they saw Job, and they were moved by Job, and everything that was wrong with him, and they were so, and they started to weep, and they started to cry, so the three of them sat down with Job in the ashes for seven days, and no one said a word. Can you imagine that? Did they eat food or not? It doesn't say. But no one spoke. Now watch this. How awkward. That was like 10 seconds. How awkward was that? Seven days. Seven days they sat and they looked at each other and they wept and they cried and they felt the pain. Most messages, and, and it's true, once the first one opens his mouth to speak, which I think it starts in chapter 3. Yeah, Job opened his mouth, was the first one to open it. And then chapter 4, Eliphaz opens his mouth. Eliphaz must have been the eldest, okay? Because usually it's the elders who get to speak first, okay? But notice, and, and you'll read and they'll tell you that what they say was wrong. Because they thought it was something else. They thought he had done something wrong that God's punished him for some reason, right? And they're right. Like, and, and whatever they said, it's completely off. But the intention of them, what they came to do for Job, how they felt about Job, when they sat for him for seven days and, and they sat there and they tried to recognize his pain and his agony and they felt it for him. And they sat for seven days and they just looked at each other and cried. Without criticizing, without looking at each other and blaming him, they just must have been like thinking about what's happening. And after seven days, Job opens his mouth. I guess they were waiting for Job to speak first. Was Job broken? Absolutely. Completely broken. Did his friends feel his pain? Absolutely. They sat in the ashes with him. They were there with him feeling his pain. Now the question I bring today about brokenness is this. What is my role or what is our role in each other's brokenness? What role do I play as a member of the church, as a pastor, as a congregant, as a friend? Like, let me take Robert, for example. What role do I play in Robert's life as a friend of Robert, as a church friend of Robert? What role do I play? What is it that I have to do? Or what it is it that's required of me to, to do with Rob when Rob is broken? What's my role? What is it that I have to do? What am I required to do? What should I be doing in somebody's brokenness at church? You've seen the tattoos. Only God can judge me. You've seen them? Right? Or the, the bumper stickers, only God can judge me. Or, or, or sometimes I've heard people tell me for some reason, they're like, don't judge me. What does it mean? What does only God can judge me mean? What does that mean? Mind your own business. Mind your own business is probably like the simplest way to say it. What's another thing? What, what else does it mean? What do you think only, only God can judge me really means? Yeah, nothing nice to say. Don't say it. Don't bother saying it to me at all. Okay, that's 
That's good. Who are you to judge me? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? What do you think, Kimmy? What does only God can judge me really mean? Well, I think they, whatever it is, like the, well, I guess it already, only God can judge me can speak for itself. It can? Just the phrase itself, you think yeah. it explains itself? You can go a little deeper, too. Uh, only God can judge me because only God can see what I think. What I do in like the darkness, or what I do behind the scenes. So tell me if I'm wrong, and it's in line with what you're saying, okay? Don't judge me, or only God can judge me, means like I'm not done sinning. So don't judge what I'm doing because I'm not done doing whatever it is I'm doing. Like, I know what you think I'm doing, but you don't really know what I'm doing. And actually, I'm not done, so like I'm doing what I want to do, I'm living how I want to live. So in the end, only God's going to judge me. You have no reason to get in my business because I'm living the life that I want to live the way that I want to live it. So don't get in it. Only God can judge me. In, in a sense, I'm not done sinning, so don't judge me. Or sometimes when people say don't judge me, it means I know I'm doing it wrong. I know like what I'm not doing is right, but don't judge me for it. You don't know what I've been through or whatever. Like the Tupac movie, only God can judge me. <sighs> yeah. But is it right? Do I have a responsibility? Or do we have a responsibility with each other to say, hey, I think what you're doing is wrong. What can I do to help? That's the part that's important. What can I do to help? You see, um, it, it's, <laughs> it's flattering in a sense when someone says to me, don't judge me. Now, I'm going to tell you something, but don't judge me. You know what that's technically saying? And not just to me. It, it's technically saying, I know you're better than this. And you're going to see this wrong because you don't have this problem or like you've overcome this already or you're not struggling with this. But don't judge me for it. We've grown up in, 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 with the idea or with, with the church and as a culture, right? Um, well, we've been told... Yeah, he, he's judging you, or they don't think anything good about you, or they don't like you. And, and I grew up with that, right? I remember my parents, man, I remember my parents sometimes coming out of church, going home, and sometimes them, like, talking about people and, and saying, man, like, it's something like, like, no sirve, they're like, they're no good, they don't like us. And I remember, like, like I, mean, it, I was young, and I said, Dick, we just got out of church, how are you going to talk about people? Or like because the person disagrees, all of a sudden what the person is doing is like they're judging them. And it's absolutely not true. Just because I disagree with you doesn't mean I'm judging you. It just means I don't agree with you. It means we can still love each other. For example, here, right? Us as, as a church. Um, let's go to James. Let's go to James. Uh, 516. Yeah, yeah, James 516. James. What page is it, Frankie? 656. Okay. 656, page 656. Go ahead, read it, Frankie. You said 516, right? Yeah. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has a great power as it is working. Oh, let me let me let me ask a question. How many of you have confessed your sins to each other? Your friends? Here, in our church. Some. Some? Some. Josh, you have? Yes. Yeah, okay. 
I know Josh has it with me. We, we you know, spend a lot of time together. Anyone else? Done it with each other? Other than, have you done it amongst yourselves? Some. <laughs> you all have. Yeah? You have? Yeah. Okay. Kimmy? Kim doesn't sin. <laughs> <laughs> That be honest, you, you, please be honest. Like, if, and no is a legitimate answer. I mean, I talk to someone I'm close with and I tell them, but okay. I don't. I mean, I only talk, I only confess. Well, I guess I don't, I guess I would use the word confess, but like only to certain people that I'm really close to that I know that what they give me back as a response would help me more out, I guess. Mm -hmm. You can say. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Rob? What you think? Not as much as I'd like to. Okay. But yeah, I have done it. What's the fear? What's the fear of confessing your sins to someone? Reputation. Reputation. Ooh, I like that one. That you're scared of what they're going to say? You're scared of being judged. Yeah. Right? Well, we're scared of the way we're going to be perceived. The, the way we're going to look. For reputation, it doesn't just fall on the person, it also falls on the family, right? Well, I, I mean, I grew up in a pastor's home. I, I had, there's a certain way I had to conduct myself, or else my dad was going to look bad. Right? There is a reputation. There's a fear amongst each other, amongst church members. To confess or to rely on each other to be able to tell each other's <laughs> struggles and sins in fear of being judged. When in reality, we should be able to feel comfortable enough with each other where we can tell each other exactly what it is we're dealing with and what we're fighting on. There's something I always say, okay, and, and, and I've said it, I don't know if I've said it from the point, but I know I tell people when, when they come to my office. I, I'd rather know I'd rather have you be honest with me or with the church and be honest here at church with what your problem is. Because if I know what your problem is, then we can help you fix it. But if I don't know your problem and you're hiding it, how can we ever fix it? See, part of brokenness it doesn't mean you stay broken. Part of brokenness is trying to put the pieces back together so that you can become better. And obviously not yourself. God has broken you for a purpose. There's a reason why we are broken because there's a purpose. But we there is a part that we play in each other's lives in brokenness. Like we all play a very important role in each other's brokenness. Like if, if, if we can't be broken by ourselves. That's why the church exists. <clears throat> Look, and it says, confess your sins to each other, your trespasses. Pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. Healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails too much. It means the prayer of a fervent man, the prayer of a believer goes a long way. So if there is brokenness inside of you, if there is a struggle inside of you, what we're saying here is that we, me and you, we play a role in each other's lives. But we're scared. Uh, we're, we're scared of being judged. You know, we're, we're, we're scared of someone saying something. We're scared of, 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 of a reputation. But the reality is brokenness requires that we help each other, that we pray for each other. So, let's say you are broken, right? <clears throat> is the question are you mad are you sad it all depends what kind of broken you are right yeah could you be I think you can start in, in one of those and end up in the other because if a girl breaks your heart you're going to be broken because you're sad because then the, your dad you know hits you then you're broken because you're mad at him. But also when we don't get things, when we're being punished, when there's something that we, we want and we don't get it, are we mad or are we sad? 
or a combination of both. Seth, both. both. And the question is, who are we mad at? Who are we sad at? I, I think if I go the wrong in my life beforehand, I used to blame God a lot. Yeah. And, and we then, all have. And then you realize it's the only person you can blame is yourself. And this is what happens with, with a person who is broke, right? When we don't get what we want, we get mad. When something happens to us, we get sad. Or, or sometimes we desire something, we're unable to achieve it, it was something we work for it, and we get e either both because for some reason you think or we believe that we deserve it, right? I deserve this. I earn this. And we blame God because we say, God, how come you didn't give me this when I worked so hard for it, when I wanted it, when I desired it? But see, that's the broken part speaking. That, that's the broken aspect of who we are that, that thinks that we deserve or God has to give us something or God's, or that you think that you deserve something, that God needs to give you something when in reality we don't. If God has broken you, God has broken you because he has a purpose for you for something that you need to do. So depending on how broke you are, it's going to depend how mad and how sad you are. The, uh, but the resolution to this is who do we run to or where do we run to so that we can fix our brokenness? What do we run to? Where does the world run to when they're broken? What do they run to? Drugs. I come to church now. What? I used to get go get higher or whatever with okay. my friends. And the interesting part is, does does that fix anything? No. Like I used to get mad and sad. I go to the bar and get drunk. The next morning, I have the same problem. Nothing no. changed. Just the only part that changed is I had a head, I had a hangover, and it made the problem worse. It's the truth. But if we're broken and we're mad and we're sad and we're mad at God, then run to God and say, God, I'm mad. I'm sad. Like help me, like fix this. See, here, what, give me another word for, for broken, for brokenness, or broken. What's another word? Heartbroken. <sighs> yeah, you can't use the word in the, in the word, okay? <laughs> so give me another word, okay? Give me another word. Pain. Okay, pain. Oh, we got a Torn. bunch of scholars here. All right, Torn. Torn. Okay. Somebody give me another one. I'm gonna give you a big one. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> give me one. Frustrated. No. How about damaged? What's another word for broken? Collapsed. What's another one? Non-functional. Dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. Okay. Broken. You can't use it again. It's dysfunctional. Worthless. Defeated. Smashed. Yeah. Shattered. <laughs> All right. All right. That's fine. That's fine. All right. What else you got? It's an adjective, so. And I think pain is a result of brokenness. Disjointed. <laughs> <laughs> There's some that I crush, defective, and injured. You guys agree? Yeah. Defective. <clears throat> injured. Injured. These are other words for brokenness. Okay? All of these. Now, have any of you ever been damaged? Have any of you ever collapsed? Have any of you ever been dysfunctional? Have any of you ever been shattered, damaged, or torn, crushed? Anyone? Have we? Have any of us here ever felt broken? The one thing, and, and I love this part, is the one thing that broken does not mean, okay? The one thing that broken does not mean is this. Useless. Broken does not mean useless. Okay? Broken does not mean that at all. 
And that's the beautiful thing, that God breaks us for a reason, but it doesn't mean or we're broken or God uses us in our broken state, but it doesn't mean that because we're broken, because we're shattered, because we've been defeated, because we've collapsed, because we've been damaged and torn, it doesn't mean that we become useless. Actually, no, God wants to use us in the state of brokenness that we exist. So actually, the, the, the state of brokenness that we exist is where God wants to use us the most. And the reason he breaks us is because we have our own desires, we have our own minds, we have our own things that we want to do. And God says, hold on a minute. I want you to start from scratch. I want you to start from the bottom. And I want to teach you exactly what it is I want from you. Because the way that you try to do it obviously didn't work. And that's the reason you're probably broken. Because you did things your way and it didn't work out. So let me give me a chance to do it the way that I want to do it. But understand that you're all this, but being all this does not mean you're useless. Actually, the Bible is very clear about uselessness. Okay, the fig tree that didn't produce fruit. What did Jesus do to it? Cursed it. He said, cursed be you. And like, well, you no longer produce fruit. The tree that didn't produce fruit, he cut it. What did Jesus say about the vine that doesn't produce fruit? What did he say? It shall be cut off. Because there's a very big difference between brokenness and uselessness. And Jesus is very clear when he says, I need you to bear fruits. Because if you're useless, you will be cut off. But if you're broken, that's a different thing. Two very different things. If God breaks, if God breaks us for a reason, if God breaks us for a purpose, it's because there is a purpose behind everything that he's doing, okay? It, it, so either you have one of two options. You become mad and you become sad and you live a life of self-pity. When you keep feeling bad about yourself, when you, you're like, I deserve this, I want this, why didn't I have this? And it determines how you act the rest of your life. Or if you're mad and you're sad, you can run to God, you can run to Jesus and whatever state that you're living in, whatever's wrong with you, whatever it is you feel, understand that in the state that you want, you are, God wants to use you broken. Because you're not useless. You're just broken. It's a temporary state. It doesn't last long. It only lasts as long as you want it to last. Brokenness will only last as long as you give it the power to take control of your life. So in our broken state, okay, in our broken state, understand that we serve a God that wants to use you in that state. There's a reason behind it. There's a purpose behind the state that you're in. See, if we understand that, then we have purpose. There's a reason. See, that's why grace is so important. Because with grace, is an understanding that no one is worthy. See, when we understand grace, we understand that everyone's broken. So if everyone's broken, I have no reason to judge anyone because we're all broken. And that's why grace is so important because when we understand grace, we realize that God came and that no one's worthy. Everyone's broken. So therefore, maybe I really shouldn't judge anyone. Maybe should I accept everyone? Maybe I should love everyone because technically God all found us in the same place. Either we were broken or he broke us. It's one of the two. But he did not leave you or will not leave you in that state. There's a purpose behind it. And I guess the question is, or, or what, I, what we really need to think about is, what role do I play, or what role do we play in each other's brokenness? To be there for them? Absolutely. We should be able to talk to each other and confide in each other and help each other out of it without this fear of being judged because really no one's judging you. It's this innate thing. I think it's a Hispanic thing, right? Like, you think everyone's against you or everyone's like, 
está hablando de ti. Like, no one's talking about you. Listen, we're not that important. We're not that interesting. Like, if you think everyone's talking about you, it means that you really think you're that important. And no one here is that important. No one's judging. Like, no, just, you know, I, I, and if, and let's pretend for a second that some people are, then let's start being the people that are not. Like, let's be those people that genuinely want to help each other in their broken state. Let's be the people that want to hear your problems and help you through it. Let's, let's be those people. Let's be those Christians. Let's be those members. That we understand that everyone's broken and I have no reason to judge you in your brokenness. Let's be those people. Those Christians. John, uh, chapter 3, verse 30. <clears throat> and ultimately, this is really what it comes down to, right? What's it say? You must be born again. That's what your version says? The title. Oh, what does the verse say? Oh, number three. Chapter 3, verse 30. 3, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Really? I mean, he must become greater, I must become less. Right? That's really what it comes down to. Less of me, more of him. Less of my sadness, less of, of, of my, my, me being mad, more of him. Más humilde y más. <coughs> more, more godly and less me. More, less of this, right? Less, try to have less of this. And the reason, the way we do that is we find purpose in whatever is wrong. Look, we're going to find purpose in whatever broken aspect we have. Whatever your struggle is, whatever your sin is, whatever it is you're going through, God will use that. It's like God loves a, a junkyard for some reason. Like God loves to go to junkyards and like grab these cars and just, you see the TV shows, they take pieces of crap and they make them into these beautiful cars and that's exactly who we are. God takes junk and just makes it into art. And that's who we are. We're junk. Junk being molded into something beautiful. And not just us, but anyone that comes through our doors. Because we were all junk. We're just in different phases of becoming something beautiful. Some of us are already beautiful. I'm already your butter. <laughs> Listen, brokenness does not mean uselessness. A brokenness is the beginning of whatever plan God has for you. Any questions? I'm glad I came to this class. Good. Okay. Let's pray it out. Pray it out, Robert.